Well, Jeff, are you with us? I am. Good afternoon. Oh, good. I just want to make sure you're unmuted. And Jay, if you are uh, unmuted uh, as well, let us know. Yes, I am. Looking forward cool. to it. Got about 60 seconds. Just wanted to make sure you're both still with us. Um, and I went ahead and initiated the recording, so we should be all set. <clears throat> well, it looks like my clock just struck 1 o'clock. Do you want to get started? I'll answer yes. Let's do it. All right. Cool. Well, good afternoon for those of you on the East Coast, and good morning if you're on the West. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, The Keys to Establishing a Planned Giving Program. My name is Stephen Shattuck, and I'm the VP of Marketing here at Bloomerang, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. And today I'm just really excited to be joined by uh, two leaders in the nonprofit sector. The first is uh, our new friend, or my new friend rather, Jeff Gowdy. Hey there, Jeff. Good afternoon, uh, Stephen. Thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, taking an hour out of your day to uh, share all of your knowledge with us. So, delighted to be here, part of the discussion. Cool. And for those of you who don't know Jeff, Jeff is the founder and president of Lighthouse Council. They're a consulting firm serving nonprofit clients in board development, fundraising, strategic planning, and communication. And uh, their firm will actually be celebrating its 15th anniversary. So uh, happy birthday to uh, Lighthouse Council, I guess is in order. <laughs> thank you. Thank, yeah. Thank. yeah. <laughs> And Jeff has more than 25 years of nonprofit leadership experience. Um, he's got a master's degree. It's just uh, he's just going to be a real great resource for uh, everyone listening for the next hour or so. So it's just great to have you here again, Jeff. So thanks for being here. Thanks. And also joining us as always is my colleague Jay Love. He's the founder and CEO over at here at Bloomerang. Hey there, Jay. Hey, hello again, Stephen. And uh, everybody out there is really in for a treat. I think Jeff's information on getting a planned giving program going is very, very insightful and uh, should be one of our better educational sessions that we've brought to everybody. Yeah, it should be good. Um, and Jay's going to join us in the Q&A session just to spice, uh, spice up that conversation a little bit. So what's going to happen here today is Jeff's got his presentation. He's going to talk about planned giving. Uh, I had a peek at his slides a little earlier today. and. Uh, it's some really great content. So he's going to run through that, and immediately following his presentation, we'll jump right into our uh, interactive Q&A session. Um, so as you're listening to Jeff over the next half hour or so, please feel free to send any questions you may have, any comments, uh, right there on that chat box, right there on your screen. And uh, he'll see those, I'll see those, and we'll try to answer just as many questions as we can uh, before the 2 o'clock Eastern hour. And just in case anyone has to bounce early or wants to uh, review the content a little later, uh, you should already have the slides, but I will be sending out a full recording of the presentation in case you want to rewatch it or uh, check something out a little bit later. Uh, so look for that to hit your email inbox uh, a little bit later this afternoon. So I'm not going to ta uh, take away any more time from Jeff. Jeff, why don't you go, go ahead and get us started? Great. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, appreciate everybody being with us today. We're going to have a lot of time for some some Q and A, and and one of the key messages really that we want to share today, uh, and is that that plan giving uh, can be easy and and simple. So we're not going to take a deep dive uh, by the nature of the topic, and that is the keys to establishing a plan giving program. So I hope at the end of our conversation today that you'll walk away with uh, one or two things that can help you either. Uh, take your fledging program to the next level or to start a plan giving program. Uh, and so we're going to keep it at that, at that, at that level where it's, uh, where it's helpful. And one of the great things about plan giving, and we're just grateful to, to Jay and Stephen and Bloomerang for this opportunity, is that it's all about relationships. And when you have, a, uh, I know Jay will be sharing uh, later in the program, but a tool like Bloomerang that focuses on communication and relationship and and it's certainly a, that, that's what it's all about. It's the basics. So today we're going to talk about uh, a, a few key points. Uh, what is plan giving, and why is it important? Uh, when is the right time to establish a plan giving program? Uh, what things need to be in place, and then how to market uh, a plan giving program. So one of the great things again is that that plan giving doesn't have to be complicated. When we talk about plan gifts, or for the for our, our discussion today, really talking about a gift uh, that could be current, 
and we'll talk about that in a minute. It could be a gift of uh, appreciated stock or other asset, or it could be planned. It could be a gift that comes to this, uh, this uh, ex, uh, develop now, but it but comes to fruition at, at a future time, like a bequest. So we'll talk more about that. So it could be current. It could be planned. It doesn't have to be complicated, and can happen at any age. And that's something that's uh, that's important. Uh, we often uh, typically look at donors at their 40s and 50s, and, and we'll talk about this more in a minute. But with the uh, you know, wealth is uh, is uh, being accumulated at a faster rate uh, today than it ever has uh, in history because of the uh, well, exception the exception of heritage wealth, obviously. But with the uh, technology and the internet and 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 you, you just the uh, incredible wealth is this happening sooner. So we're seeing more and more people in their 20s and 30s with incredible wealth that uh, in, in past times would have taken a generation for, for first first generation uh, wealth to, to be accumulated at that at that level. So it's certainly a different age, a different day. And then the plan does not compete with other giving. And uh, having been uh, a CEO and a chief development officer uh, and, and, and board member as well as a consultant, you know, oftentimes in an organization there's a tug of what well, we want to do uh, we need, we need to build our annual fund, or we need to, to, to build uh, these capital buildings. But it does not, uh, plan giving when done right, uh, helps with, is a tool for other kind of giving, and, and does, not, does not compete with, with those, those pieces. So that's what we're going to cover today. Um, you know, the reality is that um, most people's wealth, as you accumulate more and more wealth, uh, that most of us don't have, most of our wealth in a in a passbook savings account, like a, we may have uh, generations ago, that uh, 90 percent, not over 90 percent of the wealth, uh, typically is in non-cash assets, things that aren't always easily liquidated, or some that can be. So, plan giving allows us to to look at greater pools of, of resources and, and allows donors to uh, to make a difference. And that's really uh, what we want to be is really donor focused. In any plan, uh, plan giving program, it allows donors to leave a legacy, to share their values, to pass those on. Uh, there are tax benefits. We'll, we'll briefly touch on those, but enables really enables donors to do things they otherwise may not have, have been able uh, to do. And we mentioned that there is a trend uh, with with younger donors getting more and more involved. The average age for the creation of first wills and, and trusts is in the 40s. Uh, but, but younger people, as we mentioned, are looking for ways to do things for tax advantage, ways, uh, ways to, to make gifts. Um, I think we've all heard of the, the, uh, the forecast that, uh, with uh, Paul Shervish at Boston College, the, uh, you know, the forecasting that uh, for the past 15, 20 years and for the 20, 30 years to come, that, that between 41 trillion and 136 trillion would be transferred uh, through wealth, and certainly uh, the nonprofits want to be be a part of that. Uh, we're familiar with the, um, you know, the billionaire pledge, where uh, with Warren Buffett and and other leaders, where they're making a pledge to give the majority of their estates to charity. So certainly, uh, time has changed over the past 20 years. More and more organizations. Are being focused uh, on plan giving, and uh, and as, as Sherbert said, suddenly plan giving is where the money is, and certainly uh, it's where we need to be as 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 fundraising professionals. Now, a part of, of plan giving, and not not total, but something that's that's, that's easily trackable is the quest, and uh, and certainly we'll talk about that in a minute. But but to set the stage. Uh, in 2012, which is the last year for the uh, Giving USA, you know, forecast, 23.4 billion in bequests were given, 7% of overall giving. You can see a trend uh, from 73 to 2012. The bequest range from about 6.6 to 8.9 percent of all of all giving. So bequests, which are majority of of, of planned gifts. Uh, an important part of, of, of giving. I always love to look at history, and if you look back and, and think about this wave, and I'm really, it is a wave of, of plan giving and initiatives and gifts and awareness, uh, looking back to 
to uh, two familiar names in history. In, in 1638, John Harvard uh, gave his library and half his, his estate to a newly founded school in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and it's Harvard University. And then I love the example of uh, Benjamin Franklin, who was, of course, many things. He was a, a scientist, a, you know, fundraiser, philanthropist. Well, he in, made a bequest of a thousand pounds each to the cities of Austin and Philadelphia, uh, with the uh, planning that they be left in trust, further planning, uh, to gain an interest for 200 years. And then uh, in 1990, uh, when they came to fruition, uh, Philadelphia had um, $2 million in trust, and then Boston had did a better job investing, and it was $5 million. Uh, so just some great um, historic features uh, of plan giving as we talk about uh, plan giving uh, today. But again, plan giving is scalable. It can be built over time. It can be different for different organizations, but it has to be in place uh, to be successful and has to be a priority of the institution. But it's all about relationships and helping the donors uh, achieve their goals and, and, and visions. Okay, and we'll talk about some of the things that, that need to be in place uh, before uh, a plan giving. Program and, and one of those the different staffing models. So even if you have no uh, staff or, or shared staff, you can get going in, in plan giving. And so one model is is the uh, shared responsibility with development staff. Another model is to have staff dedicated to plan giving. And then if you have no staff and and and, uh, and uh, even if you do to coordinate with volunteer resources. So certainly staffing is a, is a consideration, but it's not an inhibitor. Whether you have uh, one person development staff, a hundred person development staff, dedicated plan gifts, an army of, of, of volunteers, um, you can and will be successful in, in plan giving. And then, uh, you know, when is, when is the right time uh, to establish a plan giving program? The, the answer really is when, the, when you have a track record of success. We plan giving people are, are, are thinking future. They're thinking typically larger. So you want a track record of success. You don't want to typically be in existence for a year and start looking at plan gifts so people don't have, have the assurance uh, that you're going to be you're going to be in existence. So we, we're sharing that um, you know, 10 years is a good threshold when you have outcomes or people have seen results and you've told those stories in a very compelling way. When you have been through a strategic planning process or two and you have one currently, again, where people know that you're forward thinking, you're, you're, you're being strategic in, in what you want to accomplish, you have stable leadership, both staff and volunteers, and you'll want a donor base when you begin to establish a plan giving program. And so some of the things that need to be in place when you establish a plan giving program, the first and foremost is the board commitment. The board will will be there and 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 as staff may may come and go and they have the culture of the organization. So if you're going to get into plan giving, it's essential that your board be on board 100%, that they understand the role of plan giving uh, in the organization and how important it is, that they're willing to, as with other development initiatives, help with plan giving. So if you're going to establish a plan giving pro program, take it to the next level, that is the best place, really, to start with, with the board to get them educated. Uh, if you're establishing a new program or revitalizing it, the board will be your best prospects to, uh, to, to make gifts and to identify them and have them share their stories. 
uh, whether it be in the Quest or other other vehicles. They had a question if the board should make a plan giving Kimberly. Uh, yeah, absolutely, the board should. Uh, but you also want to realize uh, I wouldn't suggest necessarily board uh, giving or a plan gift as a policy. And that's something that different, uh, but because your board is coming on with different uh, times rather than to uh, say you've got to make a plan gift for our organization, you may be better off than considering it in five or ten years. So you want to educate them, you want to invite them, but you also uh, want to uh, do it in their timing. So, But you will, with the, with the right board, you'll have a handful at least of individuals that you can approach and secure a plan gift and use that, and they need to understand plan giving and, uh, and be supportive of it. The next piece would be, with that undergirding, would be the staff commitment. And it would be our challenge as development professionals, CEOs, to hold the course that plan giving is important, that some of the greatest uh, gifts that are possible for our organizations can and will come through plan giving. But if we don't hold the course and commit to it, you know, plan giving, uh, if you think about it, that you could be 40, 50 years with a relationship before a gift comes to fruition. So you've got to have the commitment in that long-term perspective. And again, we mentioned earlier that oftentimes the CEO might come in and want to build and grow and focus on capital. Well, plan giving uh, can, can help with that. It shouldn't be seen as competition. But for staff, for the CEO, and for the development person, it really has to be a priority and, and hold the course. And the other uh, piece that needs to be in, really in place is policies uh, that will guide your program. And those policies might include and should include what kind of vehicles will you offer. Now, to have a successful plan giving program and to start a plan giving program, you really just need to keep it basic and simple. There are a lot of vehicles and opportunities uh, that are but you need to make the decision what kind of gifts you know can you handle and, and will you handle and are you are you are you uh, set up to handle? You'll also want to have gift acceptance policies. So how do you handle when someone wants to give you a, some closely held stock and how do you liquidate it, some, some gifts of property, how do you handle it, uh, what kind of gifts do you, do you take and what is it to be consistent. And then if your plan giving is geared towards endowment, and oftentimes it is, that you'll want to have some endowment policies in terms of paying out uh, you know, how you pay out every year and how the, the funds are managed. Uh, one of the things that we'd recommend if you're establishing a, a plan giving program is that undesignated plan gifts would go to endowment, and that's a discipline that will help grow endowment, and really it's just synergy that takes place uh, throughout the organization. Okay. Then how do we market plan giving? And, and, and of course, we know from, from our experience that uh, approaching uh, individual visits are the most effective. We've got the web and the great opportunities that are available now. Print publications, we find that a mix of print and web combined are, are most effective. Uh, you've got courses and the opportunity, whether it be by mail, on the web, in person, to do seminars. And then a plan giving recognition society, which is certainly a pillar of, uh, of a plan giving program, where you recognize 
uh, donors for a documented plan gift. There is some discussion whether you should ask for documentation or not. Uh, we would recommend that, uh, but certainly you need to be sensitive to the facts. The um, only, according to a, a study, that 36 uh, percent of the Quest donors who let a nonprofit know, and the um, 80 percent of those who hadn't said it was none of their business. So certainly a question of, uh, on documentation, um, but certainly an important piece of of, of plan giving. Uh, We've been a couple of studies over the past years, increasing studies, more and more research is being done on planned giving, which is helps helps with the marketing. Most of it uh, really confirms what you'd say intuitively or is common sense, uh, but it, it reflects that more and more nonprofits are getting into planned giving and, and promoting and making visits. Uh, so more and more times donors are citing the first uh, source of idea for a request uh, coming from a charity, um, more and more learning learning about the opportunities for planned gifts through materials and visits. We mentioned earlier that younger donors making planned gifts, um, and about over two-thirds of planned giving donors typically have made a cash gift. So it's not competition, but yet, think about it, there's a third of, of people who may have never made a gift to your organization that would be willing to make, make a planned gift. Some of the research that's being that's being done is uh, is actually now uh, looking at you know the reaction of the brain to to, to discussion of plan giving, and and that research, Dr. Russell James at Texas Tech is really confirming what we know that uh, what we what we believed is that she was sharing stories of plan gifts and how those would have would have made a difference and telling stories of living living donors. Also, what's interesting in some of the research is that um, older prospects are more sensitive to talking about death, and that uh, younger prospects don't seem to be. Now we don't know how they'll be as they as they age as well. So, who are our, our ideal uh, prospect of donors for plan giving? Of course, past and current donors. Plan giving donors. Someone may have made a bequest and then want wanting to consider an addition to that or a more uh, sophisticated uh, vehicle. Your board and your former board. Don't forget your former volunteers. We know from many of these studies on giving and on plan giving that volunteers are our best prospects. Networking with professional advisors. Studies are showing that they are more and more in positions of influence uh, for people and making plan gifts. And then I made the point here that the best uh, plan giving prospect, and it's no surprise, is someone that, who is single uh, or a couple with no grandchildren. That um, some of the research that Dr. Ruddle had, had done, uh, just the fact that uh, donors without children, couples without even single people are, the, are your best prospects overwhelmingly. But uh, a couple of different studies that are that are in place. Um, but one of uh, basically uh, with the uh, Texas Tech study that donors of age 50 and over, almost six percent have charitable plans. And uh, but when you segment that and look at donors who are giving $500 or more a year, um, uh, 9.4 percent have have gift plans. Uh, Stelter did some research in 2008 for adults 40 and over, younger age group, they found that 7% had uh, had a bequest and another 10% uh, would would consider. They also found some research that uh, most of the bequests are made in the last five years of life and that people don't change uh, their wills and drop charities very often. So really with 
with the um, with the uh, plan giving would be to cast a wide net, do research, focus on relationships, and 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 just realize that you got to cast that wide net because you you really you really never know. Some of the favorite stories and we've. And we often see them, but a couple of really quick snippets here. This is from February of this year. A quiet, low-profile low Washington philanthropist has left a surprise request of $28 million, one of the oldest social uh, service uh, charities in the nation's capital. Um, Herman died in November, a few months after his 100th birthday, never married, no immediate survivors. Uh, a surprise request of 50000 from a former resident will give a boost to the um, Florence uh, Spinney Scholarship Fund in New Brunswick. Retired elementary school teacher Bingram explained that Spinney was a longtime kindergarten teacher in the town. Uh, Kathleen Malgan had lived a frugal life with her twin brother Robert in the classic New England town of Simsbury, Connecticut, until she died in 2011 at age 87. Um, remembered mainly for the 35 years she was a first grade teacher uh, in the local elementary school, but now the town of 23,000 people is buzzing with the news that she had a secret, a big one, a six million dollar secret. Uh, more than a dozen local institutions discovered they've been left thousands of dollars from her estate. So just some examples of uh, of the fact that um, you you got to keep that broad net uh, going that um, a third of your plan giving donors may have never given to your institution, you know, two thirds are, and we can focus uh, on, on them as well. But it's important to always to keep that the net wide. And then just um, we mentioned partnership for philanthropic uh, Giving the Association of Fundraising Professionals case, and then we we uh, like the good work that, that the Sharp Group and Joe Shakey, senior consultant there, uh, do in terms of of, of of plan giving. But really, the plan giving programs Need to be tailored to the uh, needs of your organization. It, it's not doesn't have to be complicated. It shouldn't be. You can focus on really just four main uh, types of gifts when you establish a plan giving program, and those would be the gifts of appreciated insurance policies, plans, and there's a renewal of the the the, uh, uh, the um, IRA rollover uh, provision for giving this year, and bequests. There are a lot of other things, but really. If you're establishing a plan giving program, to be aware of the tax benefits of people giving you appreciated assets, uh, stock, property, the ability for people to either transfer or, or have a new life insurance program for your organization, for them to give a retirement program, a plan, and make a bequest. Those four, easily explainable, easily understandable, can really drive your plan giving program for success. Cool. Well, thanks, Jeff. If there's not anything else uh, from your uh, core presentation, I think we can move right into uh, the Q&A session if that's okay with you. Right. Absolutely. Cool. That was great. Thanks for that information. That was a, a, a really nice introduction to plan giving, and there were a lot of good tidbits there. So hopefully everyone uh, enjoyed that as much as I did. I definitely learned a lot. Um, looks like there was some pretty good uh, conversation happening in the chat box. Um, so if any, if any of you were maybe holding on to a question or had something you were wondering, um, we've got Jeff here uh, for the next you know, 15 or 20 minutes. He's a resource for you. And we've got Jay on the line as well. Um, so feel free to send those questions over, um, and we'll try to answer just as many as possible. And I'm just going to go kind of to the, the top of the chat room here. I was going to say, we got several of them in there already. Yeah, we got some really good discussion. It looks like, um, you know, Jeff, your, your little bit about uh, you know, including the board 
Um, that seemed to generate a lot of discussion. And I'm wondering, you know, what tips you have for maybe, you know, getting that buy-in from the board. You know, how how would you suggest a nonprofit, uh, you know, leadership approach their board with this kind of plan, and specifically getting them to actually be a part of the plan giving program as well. I know you mentioned that obviously they're great people uh, or great prospects for giving. You know, how do you approach those folks to get buy in? Well, I think you, you start with a sequential plan, and that would be they have to understand first how beneficial plan giving can be to the mission of the organization. Uh, the second piece I would say in terms of education is I would not presume that that uh, your board has already has uh, a certain level of expertise. Mm -hmm. we've, dealt with, we've dealt with boards with, you know, with financial uh, professionals and planners and very uh, people of great wealth, and you don't always have a common uh, background in terms of, of plan giving and, and, and awareness. So you want to explain to them first and foremost uh, the benefits to the organization, uh, the the in terms of dollars and helping the mission, they mm -hmm. need to understand how a plan giving program works, and it's a long-term commitment and long-term perspective, but with great yield, great opportunity. Then you mm -hmm. want to be sure that they understand, uh, you know, for their own benefit, because plan giving benefits the donor. That you want to make sure they understand uh, the different opportunities. And again, if I was starting a plan giving program, I'd keep it simple with those four basic. Uh, opportunity yeah. to give that anybody can do, and then if you, you start a plan giving society, recognition society, you will encourage board members to be a part. I, I tend to shy away from asking a 100% board to do that because mm. you're assuming, especially when you're starting the program, when it's established and, um, and you're inviting board members on to an established program, it might be different, uh, but people have different uh, points in their life. and and the question would be, if a board member does not make a plan gift, does that preclude him or her from future service? And right. That's a, question, that's a question that the organization has to make, uh, or answer rather. But um, but certainly, it it'd be you know we know that personal visits are most effective. Uh, so I would follow up the general educational piece with with business with board members, and then you begin to highlight board members who, who have made gifts and. And let them share their testimony at a board meeting in terms of uh, how they made their gifts, why they made it, how easy it was, and you set that culture. If I could offer a testimony here that might help answer the question too, uh, my first plan gift, uh, I speak from experience, uh, my wife and I have committed to uh, four plan gifts uh, ourselves. And my first one uh, was with an organization I was on the board of, and on the, on the board member intake form, one of the questions listed there, Jeff, was, do you have a will? And when I answered that, that led right into some discussions, and they did a very good board orientation that was a half a day. And they had a luncheon at the end of it for anybody that wanted to further discuss that from someone that was in the, um, you know, the development operation of this nonprofit and we talked mm -hmm. about plan giving at that luncheon and that led one thing led to another but it all started from just a simple little question in the board orientation information you filled in of do you have a will mm -hmm. excellent that's great We've got a, a neat question here from Angela here in the chat room, and Angela is wondering. Um, she she works at an independent Christian school, she says, and they've been around for 25 years, um, but they've only just sort of started in the past year um, seeking these kind of planned gifts. Um, so she's saying her donor base is kind of in its infancy. Infancy, um, and Jeff, you talked about you know when a when a when a group should be ready for these things or when they should get started. Do you think her her um, organization is ready, um, even though they've only been kind of doing fundraising for a year, year and a half, or do you think the fact that, hey, the organization has been around for 25 years is enough? Um, when do you think they should start looking at this stuff? If, if, if they've been around 25, they, they have a new donor base, obviously, uh, with just mm -hmm. being fundraising for a year, but that 25 years, if, 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 if they can answer the question, would uh, would would a donor expect them to be in existence 
in 50 years, 25 years, if they can say yes to that, then, then now's the time. And, and one of the, the uh, important pieces, and we mentioned just a couple of it, you know, how are you going to handle plan giving? Uh, you know, do you have an endowment? Because oftentimes, uh, you know, plan gift does not have to go to endowment. You want the donor to designate, but oftentimes it does, more often than not. And so where would those funds go? Do you have an endowment? So you want to go ahead and establish that endowment and have the policies in place and, and the details in place to give the donors assurance that their gifts will be used, you know, how they like. But I think that 25 years, it'd be time to, and, and, and the school and the mission, uh, it'd be time to get going. Cool. Yeah, go ahead and get going, Angela. <laughs> yeah, and one of the things, that one of our Bloomerang customers actually started uh, based upon a planned gift. It was a large gift that yeah. was left that actually started a charity. So uh, in essence, that group was in the planned giving business uh, the day they, they opened their doors, mm -hmm. the day they got their, their certification. <laughs> Well, going back to the issue of the board uh, quickly, we've got a, a neat question from Barbara here. And Barbara says that she recently um, made a presentation to her board about planned giving. And she's wondering what you think about um, a group planned gift through the purchase of a life insurance policy uh, that one of the members uh, was interested in doing that and maybe you know, sharing the premium payments over five years. Uh, with annual tax deductible gifts, what do you think of that option as a way to sort of fund uh, the actual with the program? Is that something that you've run into, Jeff, using uh, a life insurance policy? Using a life insurance, yes, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. I, I tend to want to keep things simple, and if I have a policy that that um, then becomes five people paying, I would rather them have five individual policy, frankly, just, just from a personal perspective, because mm -hmm. uh, having those five sharing, it, it makes things complicated. If one drops out, what happens? You know, there are several ways you could, with life insurance, some donor can have a fully paid up policy, and they can transfer it, and, they, and you know you've got it, and, and, and you can even cash that out. It's got a cash value, typically. And then if, mm -hmm. if people are paying on a policy, they can either uh, you know, transfer you as the owner and beneficiary, and make gifts, make gifts to you, and 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 they uh, as a tax deductible, and you have the policy, and they keep paying until it's uh, until it's uh, either comes to uh, fruition or or it's paid up, depending on the kind of policy, or they can start a new policy. So it, it's a great it's a great vehicle. It's one of those core, uh, you know, with the, the quest and and gifts of asset and cat and uh, that are so easy for people to understand, but I would tend to shy away from joint policy and, and uh, the approach well, I would I would present that as one option, uh, mm -hmm. but I would I would keep it individual in this nature. Cool. We've got a question here from Mary, and uh, she she admits that this isn't completely on topic, but she's wondering when uh, when you gents think it's appropriate to begin an, an endowment. Uh, she's wondering, is it recommended to have 10 years of success before starting an endowment? You know, is there a certain amount of time you think should pass before you, you start those things? What do you think about uh, when to start an endowment? I would do the I, same broader uh, about 10 years. Because you, your, your endowment, the same thing, is, is like plan giving, and they're, they're tied together. You want people to think you're going to be around, and you have a proven track record. I'll answer that too, Stephen. Uh, I, I think that depends. One of the best ways to start an endowment is to have it with matching endowment funds. And um, we're, we're very fortunate here in the, the state of Indiana. We have a large group by the name of the Lilly Endowment uh, uh, associated with the Eli Lilly Company that was formed. and. From time to time, they've helped organizations establish endowments. And one of the things they wanted to do was to help as many of the public school foundations start endowments. And they issued a challenge a few years ago that you had an entire year to raise up to a million dollars in endowed funds, and they would match up to one million. Mm -hmm. And many of those public school foundations started that year in the first quarter 
and by the fourth quarter they had raised a million which meant that they started off the next year with a two million dollar endowment so I would further add to that that one of the wonderful ways to do that is not only with a foundation but but with a major donor and say can we use your gift to establish a endowment uh, and can we use it in a way that would match and encourage others to do that and that particular case I, I watched numerous of those public school foundations come to life from that very very uh, you know wonderful endeavor provided by that foundation great and I'll, I'll, just, I'll just add that's a great opportunity when you when you look at endowment and, that, and, that, and the establishing of an endowment is a whole whole another uh, webinar uh, but one of the one of the things that you'll you'll want to determine is you know who's going to manage it and some organizations manage their own endowment and but one of the best ways easiest ways to quickly get one up and running is uh, if you have a community foundation in your city or in your region or state. Uh, you can simply get in there and establish a fund with a very low threshold, and mm -hmm. uh, and really what we find is that uh, once, as endowments grow, it's one of those critical mass that once you get to a couple hundred, half a million, million dollars, people start thinking of you differently. Uh, mm -hmm. and, right. and so, easy way to start would be with aligning with a local foundation. That makes sense. Well, Jeff, you talked about the kinds of people who would give you know, a gift of this nature. And James uh, in the chat room here was wondering, you know, why a person who has never made a gift to your organization would suddenly make a planned gift? Is that, that kind of scenario something you see a lot where, you know, you get a big gift and a will from someone who has never given to the organization? Does that kind of thing happen? Yeah, or is, that a, is that a rarity? Mm -hmm. No, it, it, back to the, the study, um, it does happen. About a third uh, the research shows that a third of the donors who make a planned gift uh, never gave, uh, never made a gift to the organization. Wow. So you know, but again, you know, you, you look at research, you look at studies, and you can drown in them. That's where we want to keep it simple. Uh, <laughs> but if you know the, that, that, what that tells me is, I want to keep casting a wide net. I want to keep mm -hmm. uh, at, at every opportunity, whether uh, at, at points, to share about plan giving and, and endowments. Uh, and, but then two thirds, you know, if you're going to pick focusing on one third or two thirds for outcomes, you pick you focus on the two thirds, and those are the people who have made gifts. Right, right. I just find that really interesting that you would that 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 makes up one third of gifts. That's pretty interesting. Well, we've got a a, a neat question here from uh, looks like Tamara, and Tamara, if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, I'm so sorry. Feel free to correct me in the ch in the uh, chat room there. Um, but she's wondering. Uh, she works for a, a small nonprofit. Uh, they're four years old, about four years old, and they've got annual revenue of 1.5 million. Um, she's wondering, Jeff, if, if there's any software or other tools that you would recommend to her for getting a plan program uh, policy or program uh, in place. Is there anything that you would recommend for maybe a smaller nonprofit to get going on this kinds of stuff? Well, you got a lot of, 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 of folks, and I mentioned. The, the Sharp Company a minute ago. Uh, it, I wouldn't um, if if I look at my basic four uh, types of gifts that are overwhelmingly going to have the the return for your nonprofit, whether you're, you're a million and a half in budget or or hundreds of millions in budget or billion dollar budget, uh, your, your bread and butter still would be those those four basic categories. So I wouldn't be as concerned about especially without having staff in place about software that runs calculations. But, but what you'll find is if, if what I would be with what I would look at is uh, you know possibly depending on your budget, uh, a plan giving website. You can have uh, oh. a, a, a lot of vendors, uh, you know sharp among them, they can develop a plan giving website that mirrors your site that's, that's the link uh, you know attached to your giving page. And a lot of those websites will have some basic calculations for for your donors, so uh, they, it's, it's an all-in-one package. And that, that's what I'd recommend would be if you have the resources, certainly to go ahead and you know we're, as we all aging, we're um, mm -hmm. you know we're, we're the um, demographics of uh, the internet and you know social media are changing as we age, and so one of the things that uh, certainly would look at when, when I had the resources with the plan giving website. That makes sense. 
Well, we've got about probably five or six minutes. I think we'll do a couple more questions before we start to wrap things up. I know folks are probably uh, eager to get to lunch if they're uh, a little further back in the time zones. Um, we've got another question from a, from another small nonprofit, and we tend to attract uh, that kind of audience to our webinars, which is great. Um, from Tina, Tina's wondering. She's got a limited staff. They've got limited experience. Um, she's wondering if Jeff, you would recommend establishing some sort of resource or advisory committee um, to get a plan giving program started. And, and if so, what kind of people would you include uh, on that committee? Do you think that participation would be a conflict for anyone else? Or um, and you know, do you have any experience of putting together a type of committee like that? Has it worked out? Absolutely. Even if I had a large, you know, the typically uh, called a professional advisory committee, we mentioned different models, and this would be one where you don't have any any staff, and so uh, and, and plan giving staff. So to pull together some uh, a team of pro professionals who can, you know, help with with seminars, can help with technical questions, even even what what I found is and, and as a question of you know, the software. If you have a professional advisory committee, you'll typically have people on there that have uh, various plan giving softwares, and they can run some more sophisticated calculations for you. And we'll typically do it, you know, as a part of their volunteer service. Um, right. So, so leverage that. So, absolutely, I would establish a, a professional advisory committee or a you know plan giving advisory committee, and would include you know financial planner, insurance, stockbrokers, um, you know, other other professional advisors, attorneys. Obviously, a state a state planning attorneys and general attorneys, and as a as a reference, and also uh, as, as you know, and you mentioned the conflict. You just want to be sure and have you know clear policies over um, you know what you're asking of them and what they get paid for, if anything, and what they don't, and and uh, just be sure that you have appropriate policies in place so that there there are no uh, there are no strong conflicts of interest. Right, and I might I might add to that too, Stephen and Jeff. Uh, some uh, another uh, category of people to include for that, where I've seen it be successful, are people that are retired fundraisers with mm -hmm. plan giving experience. Uh, they have been some of the very best because, uh, you know, not only the technical ins and outs that these other professions would provide there, but just some of the good strong basics of like what you should have. Uh, you know, in some of your guidelines and some and some of the different documents that you'd like to have your your policies and all. Uh, someone that's done that, that's now retired and is willing to give back a little bit of their time. They they have been wonderful resources, and and, and there's more and more of those type of folks available. Great. Well, we got a question from Sarah. Um, Sarah again works at a smaller nonprofit, and she and she's wondering, you know, how you actually ask. A potential donor for this kinds of things. You know, how do you approach someone uh, with the subject of plan giving? You know, just as a real practical matter. You know, would you invite them maybe out to coffee? Do you call them up? You know, how do you actually, you know, brass tacks actually um, approach someone and make the ask? Obviously, making the ask is one of the hardest things to do. You know, what advice would you have for Sarah on making that ask there, Jeff? Well, it's. In the ideal world, it would be like any other gift request. You want the donor to be to begin to ask you, you know, how how can I do this? What does it mean? So it, it doesn't need to be a first visit, and you need to know enough about the donor and their values and what they feel is important, what kind of legacy they want to leave. So it needs to be uh, a conversation after many, where you know about you know his or her or their circumstances, you know about their family, you know about their business. Uh, you'll, you know, but as you get to know donors, uh, you know, even casually, you begin to learn. Uh, you know, we mentioned uh, that the, some of the best plan giving prospects are obviously people with no children and and no grandchildren. One of the number one reasons that people change their charitable gift plans and take charities out is the incidence of grandchildren. Uh, and but yet, you look at the billionaire pledge and and. And you know, going back to the days of Rockefeller, where uh, you know they gave away over half their estate, the same kind of principle. You have people who are saying today, you know, enough's enough. My children have enough. I don't right. want them to have too much money. But you need to know the answer to those kind of questions, I believe, before you really, you know, have a deep conversation on plan giving. You need to know enough about the donor where you feel comfortable 
Uh, and then it becomes a time where, uh, in most cases, they may already made gifts to your organization, your organization, and and you just ask them, the, you know, a simple question of, you know, what kind of legacy would you like to leave, and, mm-hmm. and you know, have you considered, and is there any information we can provide? Uh, you know, it's it's interesting because the study and statistics show that uh, the older donors uh, don't like talking about uh, plan giving because it brings about, uh, you know, not of their death. That right. those, of us, those of us in our middle age don't care so much, but we're not at, we're not at that age yet. So mm-hmm. it would be interesting, you know, and this research is all new, it would be interesting to see how that tracks. Is, is it a change in, 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 in the mindset and behavior that will last, you know, 20 or 30 years? But it's clear that over the past 20 years, the whole discussion of plan giving, uh, the awareness of it has increased exponentially for a number of reasons. Sure. Uh, but the uh, you know the right way would be you know obviously one on one obviously not the first conversation mm-hmm. and where where you know enough about again the donor's circumstances where you can have the conversation because you want them you want to help them your goal is to help them fulfill uh, you know their desires and what is it they want to pass along what kind of legacy do they want to leave and and also that you know again a plan can be current. As well as uh, so, it may be discussion in a in a capital campaign. Have you considered uh, a gift of assets? You might know about some non-income producing assets that are highly appreciated that can be liquidated that are not helping the donor. Uh, that can help them meet an objective in their own life and finances, as well as help make a difference to your organization. Great. And Stephen, I'll, I'll jump in with answer too. If, if, if you're a, a small nonprofit, I think so much begins, uh, no matter whether it's major gifts or plan giving and uh, request giving, with your board. Uh, and I would say that group includes not only your current board, but former board members. Uh, if you can start there and then let those individuals not only become involved with a planned gift, hopefully, but let them branch you out into other people that they think would be appropriate uh, to do that and to other professionals that could help with that, that could make such a difference. But it, it all hinges, I think, for the smaller nonprofit on that particular uh, group that's the board and, and, and former board members. Makes sense. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna do one more question. I think we've probably got time for about one more before we wrap things up. And I know Jeff, we've been giving your brain a workout here. So if you can uh, share your knowledge for just one more question, we'd all be uh, really appreciated of it. And um, there's there's actually two questions here that are pretty similar. So I'm gonna kind of lump them together. Um, and they're both about kind of a sensitive uh, subject. Ethan's wondering what's the best way to convince to convince a plan gift donor to sort of provide you know, documented proof of their gift or their or their desire to give that gift. And then Jay is wondering, how often should you maybe revisit that, um, especially if that commitment was made kind of maybe earlier in their life and some time has passed. You know, that's kind of a sensitive thing. And I'm Jeff, I'm wondering how you might approach uh, that subject. You know, I, you know, I. I the the documentation and, and I we're, we're we're big on that and there we're not we're not uh, there's not a, a single voice some people say no you know don't but that is mm-hmm. typically you're you're providing them the opportunity to be part of a of a plan giving recognition society which is a yes. great vehicle. a legacy society or something of that nature yes mm-hmm. exactly so that is the the uh, entree for that society we're asking uh, for you to I would recommend provide documentation, uh, and it doesn't have to be a whole instrument. Uh, I've made plan gifts to a few organizations, and I've provided them with, you know, the page of uh, that page in my will with uh, other things blocked out, so they don't know, you know, who else is involved. But it's just that segment, uh, and 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 they can, it, you know, uh, they're aware. But it, you know, in in a, in in, uh, in return for that. Uh, for those organizations, I'm a member of their plan giving society, and I receive some recognition. Um, mm-hmm. I receive some perks. Um, so, but the reality is, as we know, you got to know your donor. And some people, we, we know that a third have never made a gift, and, and it might be a plan giving prospect. We know that a lot of people have made gifts and were never aware of. Which those those fun examples that I shared, kind of the millionaire next door story, but those are people 
who clearly the nonprofits didn't know were going to be making a gift, and and uh, in in most cases they had some connection to, to those organizations. So uh, it's just a matter of that's a part of the promotion uh, of this society and donor recognition. And we know that some donors, whether it be annual or capital or endowment, choose to be anonymous, and some are very private, and some like recognition and some don't. Uh, so it, it, if you just in a very appropriate way explain the importance of it, why uh, you'd like it that it's confidential, uh, then I would definitely uh, just just request it, and and you'll find that more and more people are becoming accustomed to that these days. More and more, uh, especially higher ed and healthcare institutions, do that. So it's in, in many cases you won't it won't be the first time that someone's been asked for documentation, but in some cases it is, and you got to be sensitive to that and know your donor and know uh, where they're coming from. Makes a lot of sense. Well, we've got about five minutes left. I think we'll end the questions there. And Jeff, just you know, thanks so much for sharing your knowledge uh, and answering so many questions with us. I, I certainly learned a lot. Hopefully, everyone who was listening um, enjoyed it as much as uh, I know that Jay and I did. Um, just in the the five minutes or so we've got left, um, you, could you tell us a little bit about you know your organization, a little bit about Lighthouse Council? and uh, how folks can maybe get more information uh, about that expertise that you just shared? Right. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. We, we partner with nonprofits are, are, uh, to help them be more effective and to increase their philanthropic support. And as you mentioned, we do fundraising, strategic planning, uh, board development uh, council. Uh, we're based out of Franklin, Tennessee in Athens, Georgia. And uh, you can see on a Take on a slide there. We'd, we're, we'd love to connect with you on Facebook, on, on Twitter. I'm at Jeff Jowdy. We'd love to connect with you there, uh, as well as on LinkedIn as an individual. We also have a company page on LinkedIn, but would love to, to hear from, uh, appreciate the listeners and uh, viewers today very much. We'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions that weren't answered, uh, would, would, would be delighted to dialogue with you, either by email, and you see it there, or through uh, Facebook, uh, we have a group page or, uh, there as well, as Twitter and LinkedIn. Yeah, Jeff, we've gotten a lot of tweets from Jeff, so don't be afraid to send him a, a tweet there on Twitter. He'll definitely uh, respond to it there if you like to use that social network. So Jeff, just thanks again for joining us. Uh, it was a really a lot of fun. Um, we've got this is actually our last webinar uh, of the year, but we've got a full slate plan for the first quarter of next year. We've got some, we're going to have some really great guests. Uh, in January, the folks from the Fundraising Effectiveness Project, uh, they're going to join us and share some of their research on donor retention kind of beyond that actual report that they send out every every year. So don't miss that. That'll be in early January. Got some other great guests uh, slated, Claire Axelrod, Pamela Grow, uh, Robert Sweeney. They're all going to share their knowledge. Uh, totally free webinars, totally educational. So check out our, our webinar page. You know, sign up for our newsletter, and you'll get the you'll get all the invitations to those as they come out. So definitely visit our page there. Um, and with that, I think we'll call it a day. So Jeff, again, thanks for joining us. It was really great to have you. Um, had a lot of fun. So thanks for being here once again. Great. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pass on my thanks to Jeff. We certainly appreciate doing it, and. Uh, Hope we get a chance to talk with some of the other folks that were out there for the session at some point in the future too. Great. Thank you. And we'll be sending out the slides uh, and a full recording of the presentation if anyone would like to rewatch and uh, maybe pick up some tidbits that they might have missed. So look for an email from me a little bit later today. And uh, have a great rest of your holiday season. Have a good, uh, a good New Year's. And uh, we'll talk to you all soon uh, next month. So have a great rest of your day.